The Rocketeer, the story of Cliff Secord, played by Billy Campbell, a young man who has a love for aviation, who finds a mysterious jetpack in a barn that some gangsters had hidden there, where he discovers the jetpack gives him the ability to fly. With the help of his sidekick PV, played by Alan Arkin, he plans to use the jetpack for special aviation shows in order to make a profit and impress his girlfriend, a movie extra Jenny, played by Jennifer Connelly. However, Cliff becomes the Rocketeer, where instead he uses the jetpack to become a superhero and defeat evil, where it turns out the jetpack was invented by Howard Hughes, and seemingly charming Hollywood actor Neville Sinclair will stop at nothing to get his hands on the jetpack, as it turns out he's secretly working for the Nazis, and wants to duplicate and weaponize the design. In this fun adventure superhero movie from the early 90s, that pays homage to 1930s serials. So, how does The Rocketeer stand up? Coming out at a time when superhero films weren't really a thing yet. Well, let's find out today as we look into 10 things that you probably didn't know about The Rocketeer. So let's do this without at all questioning how does The Rocketeer fly about without setting his legs on fire? Well, because it's a fantasy, that's why. So let's check it out. How do I look? Like a hood ornament. Number 10, based on a comic book. The Rocketeer first flew his way into the comic book world in 1982, where he appeared in Star Slayers issues 2 and 3. The character was created by American comic book artist Dave Stevens, and the tale was to be a homage to the 1930s and 1940s serials, particularly King of the Rocket Men and Commando Cody, both of which you can see the Rocketeer's look was heavily influenced by. Just as with the movie, the Rocketeer told the story of Los Angeles aviation enthusiast Cliff Secord, who finds a mysterious jetpack in his barn after gangsters who were on the run from the police hide it there, who is then thrusted into a whirlwind of adventure and heroics once he puts the jetpack on. After appearing in Star Slayers, the character proved so popular, he got several issues purely dedicated to his adventures, until finally the Rocketeer Adventure comic was released in 1988, and the brand had been handled by multiple comic book companies, such as Comico Comics and Dark Horse, and the hero still turns up on the printed page every now and then under the IDW brand. Number 9. At one stage, a Friday the 13th director tried to make a Rocketeer movie in the 80s. The concept of taking the Rocketeer from comic book panel to big screen started all the way back in 1983, when Friday the 13th 2 and 3 director Steve Miner bought the rights to the comic. But it was felt that his vision of the 1930s based superhero strayed too far away from the original concept, so nothing came of it and the rights of the Rocketeer went back to its creator Dave Stevens, and Miner directed the movie House instead. It's probably just as well. Otherwise, we may have ended up with a Rocketeer with a sack on his head with a little tiny hole cut out for him to see through. Number 8. The Rocketeer could have been filmed in black and white. Creator Dave Stevens teamed up with filmmakers Danny Bilson and Paul DiMio to make The Rocketeer into a movie, simply because he liked their ideas and felt they understood the loving homage to the 1930s aspect. Their original concept of The Rocketeer was to be a low-budget movie and to be shot entirely in black and white, not only to capture the 1930s serial feel, but to recreate it. And Harry and the Henderson's director, William Deere, was approached to direct, but he would eventually leave the project. But it was during this process that certain key points in the movie were established, such as giving the movie a glamorous Hollywood setting, a climax involving a Nazi Zeppelin, and changing Cliff's girlfriend from a model called Betty who was named and based after Betty Page, to being a movie extra who plans to be a big star called Jenny. Also along the way, the black and white low budget aspect was scrapped and it was decided to make it more kid friendly as the original concept of Rocketeer was more aimed at adults and even slightly more raunchier. Number seven, Disney had toys in their sights. 
Throughout the 80s, the Rocketeer script had been presented from studio to studio, but each time would get rejected, as superhero movies weren't really a thing back then. The only real superhero movies that existed were the Superman ones, but even at that stage they had started to decline and lose their popularity. Along came Disney and saw potential in the toy market, and thought the script seemed very toyetic, meaning they could sell toys with the movie. Personally, I don't like the word toyetic as it reminds me of Batman and Robin. Disney went through several rewrites and plot changes with the script. At one stage, The Rocketeer was going to be set in modern times, out of fear that setting it in the 1930s wouldn't catch on with modern audiences, until Danny Bilson and Paul D. Mio said, um, what about Indiana Jones? Uh, yeah, you remember him? Until finally in the early 90s, the ball really started to get rolling, and being a fan of the Rocketeer comics, Joe Johnson offered his services to direct the movie. Johnson had previously directed another big hit for Disney with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and would return to the superhero domain in 2011 when he directed Captain America The First Avenger. Number 6. Casting Possibilities So the daunting task was now on to find someone to don the helmet and jetpack and become the Rocketeer. But the big question was, who? Johnny Depp was Disney's number one choice for the part, but he no doubt would have been too busy having scissors for hands at that time. Disney also had Kevin Costner and Matthew Modine in their sights to play the part, both of whom turned the role down. Several big Hollywood actors auditioned for the part, including Emilio Estevez, Bill Paxton, who apparently actually came very close to playing the Rocketeer, Dennis Quaid and Kurt Russell. Heck, even director Carrie Kirkpatrick, who was a frequent collaborator for Disney Audition for the part, with no success. Billy Campbell was subsequently cast in the role because director Joe Johnson and Rocketeer creator Dave Stevens thought he was right for the part. They, however, had to fight for him, as the young actor was unknown and Disney wanted an A-list actor, but eventually settled for Campbell when Johnson convinced them. Sadly, Campbell's career never really took off after Rocketeer, as he mainly appeared in movies in minor supporting roles, like in Bram Stoker's Dracula, or movies that just didn't really take off, like the movie Enough. Which is a shame, as I think he's a good actor and does well with the role of Cliff and the Rocketeer. Diane Lane and Kelly Preston were considered for the Rocketeer's love interest, Jenny, but thankfully Jennifer Connelly made it out the labyrinth and was available to star in the Rocketeer. However, just as in Labyrinth, in Rocketeer she was also hit on by an older British guy, this time former James Bond Timothy Dalton, who played an Errol Flynn-type villain, Neville Sinclair. Prior to Dalton's casting, both Charles Dance and Jeremy Irons were considered for the part. Lloyd Bridges was offered the role of Cliff's mentor, Peavy, who was kind of like the Alfred equivalent in The Rocketeer. But Bridges turned the part down and Alan Arkin was cast. And when Joe Pesci turned down the part of Eddie Valentine, the production seeked out his Goodfellas co-star, Paul Sorvino, who accepted. And while we're talking about the cast, I think it's only right we mention Terry O'Quinn's portrayal of Howard Hughes, a performance that has become something of a fan favourite, and many consider this performance to be a major highlight in The Rocketeer. Number 5. Design of The Rocketeer the design of the Rocketeer in the movie is very similar to how the character looks in the comic books, in that he has a look that has a 1930s space age pulp charm about it, and even has traces of steampunk. However, Disney originally weren't sold on the helmet and wanted to modernize the Rocketeer's look and give him a NASA-styled space helmet, something which in my opinion would have been a travesty to the character. Thankfully, many people in the production were against this updated Space Age design, and director Joe Johnson even threatened to quit the project if the designs go through. So thankfully, it was decided to stick with the Rocketeer's original look. Phew. Good call, Joe Johnson. I don't know how I would have coped with a Rocketeer wearing a Space Age NASA helmet. Number four, talent on board. I swear, composer James Horner is turning up in my show more and more these days. The late composer scored the music for The Rocketeer, and he gives it a youthful, almost playful innocence, while also providing great adventure, along with giving it a 1930s feel. Horner had previously composed Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, Kroll, Aliens, Ron Howard's Willow, and Batteries Not Included. So at this time, he was the master of his craft. 
Industrial Light and Magic provided the special effects for the movie. The George Lucas owned company were and are the go-to team when it comes to special effects. It would have been tough coming up with impressive flying scenes in a post Christopher Reeve Superman era. And I believe that unlike Superman, which had grace and elegance, the flying in the Rocketeer looked more faster and bombastic, as if Cliff barely had control over his rocket jetpack, which I think adds to the intrigue of the character. Movie makeup legend Rick Baker, best known for his contributions to American Wealth in London, provided the makeup effects for the movie, particularly the exaggerated gangster features on the Lofar character, who to me always looked like a Dick Tracy villain another Disney project which came out a year earlier. Number three, filming. When filming of The Rocketeer took place from September 1990 to January 1991 and was filmed in locations such as the Griffith Observatory and the Zeppelin attack in the movie's climax was filmed next to the Six Flags Magic Mountain Amusement Park in California. Due to technical issues and bad weather, filming had gone 50 days over schedule. But regardless, Disney was so impressed with the footage of the Rocketeer being presented to them, they boosted the movie's budget from 25 million to 35 million. Number two, merchandise. So with Disney's visions of the Rocketeer being toyetic, how did it fare up in the merchandise department? Well, okay, I guess. Even though I don't remember any of the other kids playing with Rocketeer toys at the time, there was a special offer with Pizza Hut where you could get your very own Rocketeer cup, but they looked really weird. Seriously, they looked more like Spotty from Super Ted. There was also a Rocketeer costume so fans of the movie can look like the hero and the Rocketeer bendy figure. Although I don't know why they didn't just release actual action figures. I'm sure they could have come up with a pretty decent lineup. And from my own memory, bendy figures weren't popular as they lost their bendiness very quickly. In 1991, there was a Rocketeer Nintendo game, which acted as an action side scroller where players can play as the Rocketeer. I find it fascinating that the game's cover seemed to more resemble the comics than it did the movie. The graphics are very impressive for its time and full of color, making it look comic book-like, where the Rocketeer is so badass, he punches people till they explode. Yeah, you don't mess with the Rocketeer and his deadly punches of doom. What I remember the most was the Rocketeer graphic novel, which was basically a retelling of the movie in comic book format. A similar thing which also happened with the Batman movies. I had the graphic novel adaptation and I loved it. And no joke, I read it over and over again. Number one, failed sequels. Rocketeer was released on June 22nd, 1991. Disney decided to remove the Disney brand from the movie and release it under their Touchstone company, fearing the Disney logo would put off older filmgoers. However, this didn't help as the Rocketeer opened up at number four place in the box office, as it just couldn't compete with Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, which was just devouring cinema tickets at that time. Rocketeer was also behind Dying Young and City Slickers. And all up in total, it only made $46.7 million on a $35 to $40 million budget, making it a financial failure, which is a shame as it's a good fun adventure movie, which is also very well made with a great score and beautiful landscape and scenery and cinematography. Originally, The Rocketeer was going to be a movie trilogy with Billy Campbell and Jennifer Connelly contracted to star in all three movies. But sadly, after the disappointing box office performance of The Rocketeer, the subsequent sequels were scrapped. In recent years, there have been talks of a reboot. Of course there has. After all, this is the age of the reboot. But as I often say in my show, nothing has happened yet. The Rocketeer was insanely overlooked for its time, as it's a fun and competently made adventure movie. But above all, it has heart and joyful innocence about it. If you love superhero movies or movies that pay homage to the 1930s, then please check out The Rocketeer and give this movie some love. Anyway, I'm Minty. And is it just me or in the 80s and early 90s, was James Horner the king of scoring music for insanely underrated fantasy movies? See ya!